Greetings, my name is Bilal Hafiz and I'm a global strategist at Nomura. In this week's podcast, uh, we'll talk about the UK. What happened to growth, uh, to the supposed growth collapse after Brexit? Uh, what's the outlook uh, likely for the Bank of England? Uh, and uh, are we expecting anything in, uh, in the upcoming budget? Uh, to help me answer all of these questions, I'm joined by George Buckley, our chief UK economist and co-head of European economic research here at Nomura. So, uh, welcome, George. So, let's tackle the first question. Um, as you may painfully remember, many people were expecting growth to collapse uh, after uh, the referendum in the UK last year. Um, why, why didn't it? Well, in, in short, to start with, it hasn't collapsed, as you say. If you look at some of our own surprise indices, they're not just held up. They are actually some of the strongest in the world, which is quite amazing to say that we've had Brexit and this hasn't happened. Go back to the financial crisis and look how long it took the statistics office in the UK to print a negative number on GDP. It was a long time. So my own personal view is that it is, it is a case of lags. It will happen but it's not going to happen right now. And what's going to happen first? Investment's probably going to weaken, then consumer spending will weaken. I'm very nervous about my forecast for consumer spending because we've seen already that real household disposable income has fallen, and now you've got this rise in prices because of lower sterling. That will also eat away at households disposable income, and it may make it very difficult without reducing the saving ratio much more, and it's already very low, for them to consume going forward. And the decline in real incomes, that's partly to do with the rise in prices, so inflation. Um, Are wages also stagnant as well? Well, this is the concern, is that nominal wages haven't really recovered that much. They're currently growing at just over 2.5%. That's not consistent. It's Mm. it's not consistent on on the downside with the Bank of England's own inflation target. Not when you have productivity growth of 1% to 1.5% and an inflation target of 2 uh, it certainly is too low. And what we're seeing is this, um, th- this weakening in real household disposable income even before the impact from higher prices. So when that starts mm-hmm. to filter through this year, which we've already seen some rises in inflation, uh, and it will continue, I imagine that uh, that will put a big dent in, in households disposable income. And what have been the bright spots in the UK economy over the last, say, six months? Is it, consu- is it consumer? Is it consumption? I mean, to be honest, anything but retail sales over the last <laughs> couple, of, couple of months. Retail sales has started to show signs of softening, but pretty much everything else has been positive. We had a revision upwards to economic growth just a week ago. Uh, all the numbers are, are looking relatively punchy. The PMIs, which we focus on uh, quite a lot, we get those numbers very soon for, for February, um, they've been holding up. So I think, generally speaking, the data has been pretty good overall. And if we assume Article 50 will be invoked um, in the next few months, that will start the clock ticking for two years. Um, So what's your outlook um, for the next two years then? So the next couple of years, I mean, I would would argue that we are relatively optimistic on on economic growth. We have GDP of 2% this year. That's partly a legacy of the fact it was growing very strongly into the end of last year. So base effects, carryover effects into 2017. Looking further ahead than that, I'm, I'm a little bit more circumspect, I think that growth will start to t- turn over, but still, we have 1.5% as our trough, um, which mm. I think is a decent outcome, given the ca- fact we have this huge idiosyncratic shock, which is Brexit. And one of the reasons for that is because we think imports will decline very quickly, on account of the fact that we have lower consumption, lower investment, both of which, of course, suck imports in. But exports won't, because sterling's fallen very sharply, and that should be helpful. Hmm. And are there any signs of Brexit-related slowdowns or concerns in the UK economy? Yeah, I think that probably the best place to look for this is investment. I mean, we know that uncertainty is the enemy of investment. When you look at what's happened to investment, the surveys have been weaker. Um, The the official data, we've seen uh, a decline in in the final quarter of last year. Uh, So we are starting to see that come through. But relatively speaking, it's it's, it's not fallen off a cliff as yet. And uh, I think there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of time for that to happen. And uh, so where does that leave the Bank of England? So as we know, immediately after Brexit, they introduced uh, additional easing to the economy. The economy's recovered since then. So there could be a case to say they overeased, or they, I guess, would argue that they helped stabilise things. I mean, where do you stand on the Bank of England? I personally think they went a bit too far because they didn't wait until finding out 
what Brexit would actually mean for the economic data and the economic data held up better. I'm not sure whether they would have done the same thing again had they known, but of course economics is very uncertain. Um, in terms of what we think they will do going forward, the, the bank's got a juggling act. It has to look at inflation on the one hand, which is going to rise. Our own forecast is for it to rise just shy of 3% over the course of the next 12 months. And on the other side, they've got to look at the growth outlook, which clearly has to be weaker on account of Brexit. And the growth outlook will have an implication for longer term inflation. Um, we've spoken on these podcasts in the past about inflation and what, what uh, we think is going to happen to global inflation. And uh, our chief European economist, Andy Cates, thinks it's going to be higher. But I think with Brexit, it could be lower in the longer term for the UK at least. Um, simply because we have weaker demand uh, and therefore the output get pulling down on inflation. But for the near term, the bank's got to juggle these two things. What will they do? I think until Mark Carney departs the bank, which is middle of 2019, he's been very dovish. I don't expect him uh, to sanction a rate hike at any point during his uh, tenure at the bank. And therefore, I think it's going to be towards the second half of 2019, if not later than that, when the Bank of England starts to raise interest rates very gingerly indeed. Okay, so like a protracted period of low rates are still uh, ahead of us. Um, now, we have the budget coming up uh, in, in the UK. So are we expecting any big changes, any big stimulus or any, any uh, changes on the tax side? Well, I think there's lots of reasons for the, for the relatively new Chancellor, Philip Hammond, not to do anything uh, in terms of fiscal stimulus. Uh, number one, he, he did a very large fiscal stimulus back in November last year at the autumn statement. Number two, he's changing the whole structure of the budget so that they happen in the autumn time and not the March time. So the last thing he's going to want to do is make a big thing of the last March budget. And thirdly, the um, economic growth has been, as we just talked about, been a lot better than we thought. What's the point of providing some big fiscal boost? It's not required right now. They should keep their powder dry for uh, maybe the autumn time or, or beyond if the economic news does weaken. So I don't think there will be a substantial fiscal easing or any uh, change to the, um, the uh, fiscal stance really in this budget. And um, I mean, just to kind of wrap this up, I mean, is there anything uh, that's on your mind that we haven't talked about in relation to the UK? Um, well, I, th I think we could go on for a long time <laughs> talking about uh, UK as the, the political issue. And I think one, one point about Brexit, which I would say is that uh, there are a lot of uncertainties created by Brexit. We don't know uh, how long it's going to take, particularly to achieve a free trade agreement afterwards. And the big question on all our minds is, is there going to be a cliff edge mm -hmm. at March 2019, two years after we leave, when Article 50 comes to an end and we have to be out? Uh, will there be one? I, I'm, I'm assuming there won't be, but I think it's very difficult to see um, what will be in place to stop that. Uh, so there's a lot of questions about that cliff edge and whether that will cause a significant deterioration in economic growth at that point. Okay, that's great. So we covered a lot of material on the call. So we've uh, looked at all the different segments of the economy, the Bank of England, uh, the fiscal outlook, and of course, uh, Brexit. So thank you very much, George, for that uh, outlook there. Um, and if, if people want to have a more uh, thorough investigation into the UK outlook, uh, feel free to go to our website where we have a number of publications which go into much more detail on our view on the, on the UK. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to, to people listening into our next podcast.